Um, thank you all for attending. Um, this is the session Beyond Asphalt, How to Evaluate and Create Inclusive Experiences for Trail Users on Adaptive Mountain Bikes. Um, Amanda already had mentioned this in the chat, but if, uh, if you've joined since, please um, put your name and your organization in the chat if you would like to receive CEUs. And even though you already heard us all going through our introductions, let me formally introduce our presenters. Um, Jill Van Winkle, Jeremy McGee, and Jeremy Robbins, who we will be referring to as JJ for this session. Um, so without further ado, I will let you all take it away. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Bronwyn. I am going to hopefully share my screen here. Um, get my presentation shared. Hopefully everyone can see that. Okay. All right. Let me know if you can't see it. Um, so, um, hi everyone and welcome. I did a little housekeeping here. Um, and thank you for joining this session on adaptive mountain bike um, facilities. Um, uh, Bradwin did a quick introduction. I'm going to do a little bit more introduction to give you a little more background into our speakers today. Um, Jeremy M uh, P. Hey, McGee. Jill. Yeah. Yes. Jill. Uh -huh. Yes. Can you hear me? Sorry, maybe you can't hear me. Um, hey, Jill, we can see your notes on the screen. Oh, wrong. Yes. Oh, that's weird. It says I'm sharing this screen. Weird. Okay, let me try that again. Um, so, stop. Let me try that again. Weird. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, hmm. Should be showing my PowerPoint. Um, Oh, maybe when I moved this over, hang on. I think that's what did it. Switched. How's that? Are you seeing the PowerPoint? You can see your entire screen. Um, okay, let me try this. What are you seeing now? Seeing your presenter view. Oh, really? With your notes. With my notes. Oh, weird. Um, let me try that. Did that work? That's it. Okay, good. Weird. Anyway, I, sorry about that. Okay, let's try that again. <laughs> Strange. Okay. Thanks for um, letting me know. I practiced with Zoom last night, but I guess I need someone else to be watching it. Okay. Okay, let's try that one more time. So um, Jeremy P. McGee is an adaptive athlete and founder of the Unpavement Project. Um, before being paralyzed in a motorcycle accident in 2001, Jeremy was a runner, surfer, semi-professional snowboarder, and lifeguard. After becoming paralyzed, he continued his athletic career as an adaptive adventure athlete, learning to surf, ski, climb, paddle, and mountain bike all over again. In 2012, Jeremy became the first paraplegic to ascend and ski a major backcountry peak in the Eastern Sierras, and went on to tour with a docu documentary film, Drop In Bloody Coolar. Today, all of Jeremy's time is dedicated to the unpavement, whose aim is to provide better and safer access to nature and wild places for adaptive mountain bikers. Jeremy Robbins, uh, JJ, <laughs> has a master's of science in rehabilitation counseling <laughs> from Portland State University, where he previously counseled students at the PSU Disability Resource Center. The experience of assisting thousands of students with every imaginable disability and collaborating, advocating, and giving them structure and support has well prepared him to serve the breadth and depth of disabled students, job seekers, or patients he is meeting. Jeremy became a C5-6 quadriplegic as a result of a bicycle accident in 1999, and since then he has lived the motto that life rolls on, and no matter where he goes, he brings a unique perspective to the team. True to form, a decade after his cycling accident, he was the 2009 Northwest Collegiate Hand Cycling Champion for Portland State and was pivotal in the creation of their accessible recreation program. 
Jeremy continues to enjoy cycling and hanging out with his parents in their home in Vancouver, Washington, reading and going to live music events. Adaptive cycling and having access to the outdoors have been driving factors in Jeremy's recent endeavors with his help in the creation of Adaptive Bike Town, Gateway Green uh, Bike Park, and various sites with Portland Parks and Recreation's Accessibility Advisory Committee. This work will cement the way for accessible play spaces that children of all abilities need to be able to get into nature and interact with their physical world by removing barriers to entry. This is kind of long. Um, and I'm Jill Van Winkle. I'm the Natural Area Trails Coordinator for Portland Parks. I oversee the management, monitoring, and maintenance of over 140 miles of soft surface trails in Portland natural areas. I've been with the city since 2016 and have 17 years of experience in planning, design, and construction of trails for non-motorized users. Prior to joining PPNR, I was a project manager for Imba Trail Solutions. My professional educational focus has been environmental impacts associated with trails and trail use. And I have a master's in environmental science and management. Um, and I've helped to develop several trail resources, including managing mountain biking, um, bike parks, Inva's Guide to New School Trails, and the BLM's guide, Guidelines for Quality Trail Experiences. OK, that was a lot long. OK, we'll get into the meat of this, see if I can make this work now. OK, a uh, quick overview of our presentation for today. Um, what is adaptive mountain biking, which we will um, summarize as AMTB. Uh, we will discuss um, an adaptive mountain biking rating system created by the unpavement. Then we'll talk about Gateway Green Bike Park, including the vision for adaptive facilities and the design build process for the adaptive mountain bike trail. We'll discuss how to develop adaptive mountain biking facilities. And finally, we'll have time for questions and discussion with attendees. Okay, if you are a, a trail user on an adaptive device, it can be frustrating feeling that paved or gravel ADA trails are the only spaces that you can safely navigate. Adaptive mountain biking can help to fill that void, but what is adaptive mountain biking? Um, one aspect that comes to mind first might be the equipment. Um, Jeremy and JJ, can you tell us a little bit about the range of adaptive cycles and all-terrain wheelchairs? Um, Jeremy, why don't you go first? Which Jeremy? Sorry, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you you're asking about the range of equipment. Yeah. What are what are, what exactly are we dealing with when we're talking about adaptive um, mountain bicycles? Yeah, uh, we're talking about a very wide range of equipment. Um, you know, uh, you you know, Chris. I, I always use the example of Chris Orr. Um, he's he was in the photo of two slides back. He's on a two wheel bike. You never notice, but he's an adaptive rider. He's got um, you can go back and show one that. foot. You can see that guy in the blue shirt, he rips. He goes off big jumps and is hanging with the big boys. He's on a two wheel bike. You would never notice, but um, if you look really closely um, at his it's left foot person. there on the pedal, he has one leg shorter than the other and is missing half that foot. Um, he is an adaptive rider. Um, where that might not be so obvious, but someone in equipment like this is very obvious. Um, and it's a wide range of equipment, the equipment itself, uh, varying in capability as well. Um, you've got your front wheel drive bikes versus rear wheel drive. You've got your tadpole design bikes versus your bucket bikes. You've got bikes with power assist without um with suspension without and uh the the gamut of adaptive equipment is is growing especially as more and more equipment and different styles of bikes become available so what are the specifications or constraints on these kind of bikes as compared with a two-wheeled or non-adaptive bike uh the way i always answer that question is you would be really surprised what these bikes can get through. You think single track and you're like, no way, but actually with the suspension, with the impact of the trail, you'd be really surprised what these bikes would get through. You'd also be really surprised what stops them. Um, for, for the tadpole design bikes with three wheel design, and this is all changing now um, as the equipment uh, progresses, which is, and the equipment's really advancing fast. Um, Right now, the, the, the biggest nemesis is off-camber and especially exposed off-camber. 
that's what's really going to stop one of these bikes. And of course, you know, narrow pinch points. Um, but that is all changing. Um, and in the next couple of years, this conversation is going to be very different. JJ, do you want to talk about anything about adaptive cycles or what, what you have or what you, what your dream bike is? I think that, uh, for me, the, the biggest change that I've seen, um, especially with off-road hand cycling has been the addition of um, electronic assist. And um, really what, uh, what that does is that gives, that would give me um, as an adaptive cyclist, the ability to go and ride with able-bodied cyclists on trails that um, I may or may not have the strength to be able to, to ride. It also um, increases the, um, the, the time that I'm able to be on the hand bike um, and uh, so that, that's really exciting that um, I would say within like the last four years, um, the uh, electri electric assist has been the big thing. Um, and uh, uh, added to that, there, there actually are, um, I guess you would call them hand cycles. There's a company called Bowhead Corporation out of Canada, and they make just, it's just an electric powered bike, um, but it's, it's really powerful. It's waterproof. It, it deals well with a camber. And so um, these are really um, kind of where the technology is taking us. It's, it's really an exciting time. Great. Thank you. Can I that. go ahead and oh, so yeah. there's a question, there was a question about um, Maya. Thank you for your question about off camber and um, thank you for your answer. Will um, Will's exactly right. Uh, cross slope, but I would just take out the word severe because it only takes minor cross slope um to, to to stop when you think of these bikes tip really easily um to the you know they flip over to the side and all it takes is just a little bit of cross slope the trail could be fine and then you hit a little rock and it happens fast um and then downhill wheel can get off pulled into the fall line and off trail uh, really quickly and easily and so that's what's meant by off camber. Thanks. That's a good question, Maya. Yeah, thanks for, for clarifying that, Jeremy. Um, so I think we could probably spend the whole um, the whole session talking about some of the cool um, new innovations in bike design. Um, let's talk a little bit more about what makes a good AMTB trail. Jeremy, can you want, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, I can talk all <laughs> night about this because I don't want AMTB trails. I don't, I don't want to be, and most adaptive riders don't want to be segregated. Um, this is the big misconception when it comes to, uh, uh, adaptive trails that there, um, needs to be adaptive trails, um, and what those trails are. Um, I want to ride the same trails as you. And, um, most cases it's just like one little spot here or there that just needs a little, widening or a little camber taken out or something like, or a, you know, something with a tree gate or something like that. And, uh, we never want to change the nature of a trail, of course. And, but if it only takes, uh, you know, a couple little changes to get an entire other user group through, that's our goal right there. Um, I want to ride trails. I want to be with my friends. I want to be, I want to be riding with the big boys. Um, I don't, I don't want to be segregated to, um, flow trails only flow trails are great. They're fun, but, um, I like tech. I like rocks. Um, I like problem solving and there's all types of different levels of adaptive riders. So the misconception is that it needs to be something that's very dumbed down. Um, that's just smooth, flat, wide. That is not the case. Um, there's a whole spectrum of riders and uh, we can get in that into that in our later in our conversation, um, but where those riders land, um, whether they need assistance or not, that's that's what we're going to be looking at. So adaptive trails, um, maybe uh, you know a better phrase would be adaptive friendly or mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, and we'll get into the rating system that the M Pavement uses um, that explains all of that. Um, but what makes a good adaptive trail is, um, you know, I, I guess something I can get down safely and be able to get home without breaking myself or my equipment. That makes a good, that makes a good adaptive trail. 
KJ, do you have anything you want to add on that? I think that uh, for, a, for a lot of folks, it's um, having something that's writable yet challenging enough that when they return, they're still uh, getting uh, a fresh experience. And so it's, um, you know, uh, definitely want, want to consider a lot of beginners, but also um, have enough uh, challenges that uh, as the skills advance, which they inevitably will do, um, that the, 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 the trails are still um, uh, fun and, and a challenge. Um, so that's, I think, the, the key thing there. Yeah, I think that this is um, what's what's really true is that just like any user, just like any mountain biker, you want uh, you both have mentioned the importance of access to nature, and you want the kind of experience, the intimate um, trail experience that that these kind of trails provide versus a, a paved or gravel pathway, um, and so that like challenge and play and nature and escape are really uh, critical. Um, a trail experiences that, and, and just like any trail user, there's a whole range of, of types of riders, right? And what to things people are seeking. Um, so I really appreciate that, um, that change in kind of looking at it as an adaptive mountain biking trail versus a, a trail that is, is friendly for adaptive uh, equipment. Jill, is this a is this a good time to talk about that range of riders, or do you have that later in um, the presentation? Yeah, we can. I, we do go into the um, AMTB rating. Do you want to just I think we'll get get to that. We could talk about it there. Sure. It might be next. Yeah. Let's see. Ah, here it is. There good. it is. Um, so can you talk about the EMT rating system? And maybe this is a good place to talk about that range of ridership. Like what were you looking to do here? Okay. Well, let me talk about the range of ridership because okay. that's, that's where we're at in the conversation. Great. Great. Um, so this rating system, well, one, um, does not address difficulty at all. This stress addresses only answers the question, do you need a support rider or not? The other information already exists. Uh, and anybody who's going to perform any type of trail research is going to, you know, look on trail forks or wherever and information on difficulty is already there. It might need a, a slight interpretation um, to be applied to the adaptive um, realm, but it's already there. This just answers this. We're not reinventing the wheel here. This just answers the question, do you need a support writer or not? And let me ask you this question. This is a trick question, um, kind of a trick question. Actually, no, let me explain the um, the scale of writers first. The scale of writers, it, so this, this rating system is based on a curve um, on that the mean, the average writer. And the, and the curve is based on the equation of writer ability rider disability and equipment capability. So let me explain that. Um, and we like to stay away from beginner or advanced rider because there could be someone who is an advanced rider, they've been riding for a really long time, but finds themselves kind of in the far left of the spectrum because maybe they have a front wheel drive bike without a power assist, so they have you know, relatively less capable equipment, and maybe they're a high level disability. So even though they're an experienced rider, they find themselves in the in the far left end of the spectrum because of their equipment and their disability level. Whereas you might get the, you know, brand new hot shit, low level paraplegic guy on a bowhead riding for the first time, and he's in the far, extreme far right end of the spectrum, but he's able to ride or her, you know, on their even first time riding because they're really low level disability and have really capable equipment, um, what they're able to ride is very different. So we stay away from the, I like to stay away from the words beginner at advanced because that's only one part of that rider equation and the spectrum. Now the trick question is, why can most far less spectrum riders ride more than far right spectrum riders. So maybe that um, experienced rider with the front wheel drive bike with no power assist, who's maybe a quadriplegic, why can they usually ride more than that hot shit paraplegic kid on a bowhead? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> because usually the far less spectrum riders have a rider support. 
Whereas a lot of the right and spectrum are going to be riding solo a lot more and someone, an adaptive rider with ride support, what they can ride is way different and way more than what a rider without support. So interesting question to think about. Now, when it comes to the rating system, we, and we've added to this, really the basis of this, the meat is the AMTB one, two, and three. AMTB stands for adaptive mountain bike and AMTB one, uh, when it comes to answering the question, do you need a support rider or not? Means no, you don't need a, Now this is based on what most riders will experience based on that mean, not all riders. So riders in the extreme ends of the spectrum may need to shift the scale one notch. So AMTB one means no, you don't need a support rider. AMTB three means yes, you do need a support rider. AMTB two, maybe. A lot of trails fall into this. And so because of that, this is all based on the golden rule, adaptive riders, if you're out there, if you're listening, never ride new single track alone for the first time. I'm telling you from experience, I'm sick of gambling with my equipment. I'm sick of gambling with my body. I'm sick of gambling with my experience of the day. <laughs> A lot of the times, if you, uh, when it comes to the question, should I go down this trail or not? I really want to. Don't, don't do it. Um, a lot of the times you'll be fine, but then that one time where you're not really sucks. Um, I've been out there and it can turn just a normal day into a really shitty experience. Um, and then we add on the ends of this rating system. The AMTB zero is your ADA pathway. You're, that's, you're very flat, um, sometimes even hard surface, well, appropriate for a, uh, possibly appropriate for a manual wheelchair. And then on the other end of the spectrum, the not rated, not suitable for AMTB, that means basically this, the, the reason for that is um, some in adaptive mountain biking, we can cross the line from mountain biking to mountaineering. So if a uh, trail requires, you know, ejecting from the equipment requires a crew of, of people, you know, more than two or three people, that's okay. You can, when there's a will, there's a way you can get point A to B. But when it requires those types of things, that that's where it kind of crosses the line. And right here, we're looking for what's going to have what, what's going to create the best mountain biking experience. And so when it crosses that line into mountaineering, that's where we add the the not rated. Like, hey, if you're mountain biking, this might not be the the trail for that day. But if you're climbing a mountain and using your bike, that's something different. So that's kind of the the rating system in a nutshell. Um, Trail Forks asked me to come up with a very simplified rating system that's duplicatable um, over, you know, all platforms. And so that's why we've come up with this simplified format. So thanks for sharing that, Jeremy. I should um, yeah. want to uh, highlight that there's some really great um, videos and ratings on on the end pavement website. Um, so there uh, obviously there's a lot more that needs to needs to be done. Um, but Jeremy's done a really nice job of putting together some videos, which are really the best way, a really great way to see all of the obstacles that, and the challenges of those um, of those trails. Um, and you can see also mentioned, like for instance, on the lunch loops, it has the AMTB one to two rating, and then it has the the X that indicates the, the, the skill factor um, as well. And then uh, there's some a uh, 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 screenshot of of Trail Forks's um, ratings, the trails that they have rated. Um, do you want to talk a little bit any more about that, Jeremy? Yes. Uh, sorry uh, to break things, in real, um, sorry, real quick. Oh, sorry, I was um, we have a couple people. We okay, yep, that's what I was just going to do. Oh, the questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Katie and, and Jackie, thank you for your question about rider support. Um, basically, a support rider, uh, an able-bodied uh, person who's riding with an adaptive rider that um, can spot them, carry them, um, help, help them out in, in any, in a situation. Um, and then Jackie, you also had a really good question. Have people with disabilities contributed to the rating system? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's pretty much, it's kind of hard for an able-bodied rider to rate a trail, um, or, um, someone that's not in an adaptive bike to rate a trail. So if there's an adaptive rating, it is almost always done by an adaptive rider. I happen to be an adaptive rider myself, and um, it's been a one-man band up until just recently. 
uh, we are working on training ambassadors to um, document trails in all their respective areas. I hope that answers your question. And then the other thing I wanted to say, um, which I know I've uh, noticed in this um, slide that you have here, Jill, I see see there's a AMTB one to two X. That X um, is something we have added to the rating system, which means basically advanced features exist. Um, for example, you know a jump line um, is wide open in AMTB one, but it's got features on it. So to clarify that difference, we've added that little X. And um, so a jump line is going to be AMTB one X. That might be something like you know a rock garden or anything technical or advanced. Um, and then the other thing we've added is a plus sign, um, and it only really applies to the AMTB one range. And that little plus sign just changes that word most, what most riders will experience, to what all riders will experience. So something where you see an AMTB1 plus means you don't have to shift the scale no, what, no matter what end of the spectrum you're in. No matter what, all adaptive riders can ride this trail. Great, thank you. Yeah. And thanks for thanks for the questions that are popping up in the chat. I wasn't I didn't have the chat open, so now I can see that. Um, OK, we're going to move on um, to Gateway Green um, and the projects, uh, the adaptive facilities there. So um, here are some aerial shots of Gateway Green. Uh, Gateway Green is located along the I-205 bike path about a half mile north of Gateway Transit Center. For those of you who aren't familiar with this area, the Transit Center hosts uh, three uh, light rail lines, um, uh, dozens of bus routes, uh, has a park and ride, a shopping district, and a bike path. Um, and so the, the, the um, Gateway Green uh, Park is only accessible from that bike path that runs parallel to the park. Um, the site is surrounded by freeways and rail lines, you can probably see in these photos, um, and there's that bike path that runs the length of the park connecting the neighborhood of Maywood Park, uh, to the north, about a quarter mile to the north, north, and then through to Gateway Transit Center to the south. Um, so in, in these views, the inset photo at the bottom is the view of the jump lines um, uh, that, that start at the south end of the park. Um, and then uh, because you couldn't really see them very well um, uh, in the other view. And then this, the, the larger view is the view of the park um, from the north end looking uh, to the south. So you can see the freeways on either side and the bike path that runs um, along the length of it, along with some of the other facilities that we will go um, into. Um, so this is Portland's first bike park. Um, as I mentioned, it's 24 acres surrounded by freeways. Uh, it's all got a lot to fit into this space with a unique and challenging premise that it is accessible only via the bike ped path. There's no vehicle access to the park. Um, uh, park features include beginner through advanced uh, jump lines, about two miles of single track trails in the forested area, a skills area, an asphalt pump track, jogging path, restroom, and a nature play area. Um, and additionally, there is an ADA accessible spine road that traverses the park and, of course, um, an adaptive mountain biking trail. So just to kind of go, this give this little overview of Gateway Green, it's a very popular um, site with a diverse riding community. And one thing that was really, um, we were really looking for in the design of this park was that it would be um, available for riding for any type of rider, any skill level, any type of bicycle. Um, and we really see that when you're out, the photos here demonstrate a pretty typical um, after school day, when it's sunny or a weekend, the park is really, um, alive with riders um, uh, of all kinds and on all kinds of bicycles. Um, and so um, to that end, we were really trying to, um, to capture um, uh, and, and be inclusive in the types of, of riders that are there. Um, and so Gateway to Green Adaptive Cycling. Um, so uh, JJ uh, serves on the Parks Accessibility Advisory Committee um, and uh, rode in this area before it became a bike park. Um, JJ, can you talk a little bit about the vision for accessibility at Gateway Green? Sure. So <clears throat> I think first and foremost, Gateway Green is a is a city park and um, city parks have to be accessible. Um, they have to be ADA compliant. Um, and so especially new builds. And so this was great um, because uh, 
it gave us a chance to um, use a space that um, has been around for quite a while. I can remember actually writing um, in this space before it was anything in like 1997 and 1998 because um, uh, I, I lived in the neighborhood. And so um, uh, there, had, there had been a push for quite a few years through a group called FOG, which is the Friends of Gateway Green, to, to really utilize the space, find, find something to do with, with what was at that, that point um, just kind of um, land that was being unused. And so they, they wanted to make a park of it. And um, it, it kind of uh, morphed into this vision for a mountain bike park, which um, is really, really um, uh, very progressive. There really aren't any other dedicated mountain bike city parks that I know of in, in the U.S. And so um, uh, this was really um, a very novel idea. Um, you know, my job is to make sure that... Um, when I um, am approached by folks that are doing construction, um, that are um, uh, involved in the process of developing these parks, that they um, that they understand that the ADA has to be a part of it, and then um, you know that the pack is more like the the wheels on the ground sort of um, arm of the Portland parks, and so. Um, we, we visit a lot of these sites and um, we're able to, um, with our knowledge of the ADA and, and access, we're able to, to give um, tips on what's going to make it um, uh, even more accessible and, of course, uh, up, up to code. Um, and so as this park kind of took shape, um, uh, the involvement from the disabled community um, became uh, really necessary. Um, the biggest supporters that 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 I had as as a disabled person were actually from um, some older um, uh, ladies that uh, uh, were wanting to be able to get into the space to be able to watch their grandchildren. And when you have a couple of ladies with walkers that that really want to get into a place, they they will be the the grease that that gets those squeaky wheels. And so. Um, they, they really um, emailed, called, and um, really made well known what their vision for this was, which not only is it accessible, but um, this it's got this great spine, which is, um, you know, a, a spine is what everything else kind of pops off of. And so it, it symbolically, it was really kind of uh, cool that they chose to, to name it that. The spine is a paved path. Um, it's uh, all under 5% grade. Um, it goes from one end of the park to the other, and it gives people um, that are walkers, that are um, in wheelchairs, that um, uh, have canes, all of those sort of mobility challenges. It gives them a chance to be able to get in here and to um, experience the, the, the joy that um, being out in, in nature really, really brings. Um, the other thing is that it, there's a couple of spots that are... Um, designated as kind of being like uh, pit stops or, or rest spots um, on the spine so that, um, you know, uh, uh, not only can these ladies um, see their grandkids, they can see them from different locations um, and they can um, get, get a rest in as they're, they're moving through the space. And so that was um, one of the, the big things that we, uh, that we pushed for was to have these little um, uh, kind of, uh, 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 areas of respite, um, you know, making sure that the services were accessible. So, you know, having an ADA toilet um, was a big deal. And then, you know, the site itself um, is not that easy because it, it really is kind of in a ravine um, to, to keep things under the 5% grade. And so um, there was some some banter back and forth about you know the thought of of really changing some of um, the um, the cycling tracks um, and ultimately what what I think happened is that there uh, instead of changing things there was just um, uh, better signage that was put up uh, there was you know people like um, Jeremy McGee that were included so that his trail rating system could help inform. Um, uh, other cyclists exactly what they were going to be able to get into and or what they aren't going to be able to get into. Um, 
none of this happened overnight. It was pretty intensive. Um, you know, a, a lot of this happened starting in like 2018. Um, the construction uh, really was finished up last, uh, early this last year. And so this was kind of the, the full, um, the first full summer of use. And so I'm sure that we'll have to kind of go back and figure out what's working, what's not. Um, I know that uh, in the future, um, one of the big things that that um, they would like to remedy is, is better access, um, like being able to park your car and get into the site um, as it currently is. You really mostly have to use the Gateway Transit Center. There is some limited parking in Maywood Park. Um, but from both of those sites, it's still a good quarter to a half a mile before you're actually hitting the dirt. So um, there are some issues with that still. Um, anyway, I, um, the, the, the PAC uh, really felt like this was a great project. Um, they, they, um, they felt like they were really heard well and that the design reflects um, the needs of people with disabilities kind of across the board. So it was, it was a really rewarding experience. Great, and I think that um, JJ's advocacy was really um, critical in getting that spine road. Um, and you can't see it as well from this view, but if you're looking from the, the, from the south end looking north, you can really see that it winds, as you mentioned, because of the grade change. And it's really important to get that in there. And it's a, it's a really important um, facility um, and really, really great that, that they pushed and didn't, um, didn't give up on, on making that um, uh, as, as a part of this site. Um, so when we talk about the um, adaptive mountain biking um, trail uh, specifically too, um, here you can see there's um, the, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor at all? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Yep. Okay. So this is the spine that Jeremy was talking about that goes and it kind of winds all the way through the site. And then um, uh, the original um, part of the um, ADA loop was to have a, um, have this uh, like perimeter trail that is actually um, a, a gravel um, ADA path and then have um, adaptive mountain biking skill stations uh, alongside of it, adjacent to it. Um, so we're gonna talk uh, more about the adaptive cycling trail specifically. Um, so this um, was a design build process at Gateway Green, meaning there wasn't actually a plan for this. Um, there was a, a, a plank slate really, there was um, a design for the for the, for the uh, ADA uh, loop, um, and then really just some kind of a canvas um, on which um, these um, these skills areas could be, could be built and little side trails. Um, and so we first created that path and then had um, options for where within this, this, this whole area um, the facilities could be placed. And the plan was to bring in a team, design and build the features at the same time. Um, so with the adaptive mountain bike, bike features adjacent to the, the path. And um, these photos here were taken during the construction. So you can see there's a, it's a little bit rough here. Um, and there's a picture of both um, Jeremy's uh, there with um, Chris Bernhardt from C2 Recreation, who was one of the consultants on, on the build. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about the how did the design build go. We brought together a great team. A couple of those members are here, the Unpavement, um, and then C2 Recreation, uh, Sasquatch Trails, Input Trail Solutions, and PPR. That's a lot of people. Luckily, most everyone had worked together before, mostly with IMBA, um, but it required an open mind, creativity, and a lot of collaboration. Um, so we, um, before um, we commenced, we were able to get a lot of equipment staged, a mini excavator, a mini dozer, uh, Jeremy even got to run. Um, adaptive bikes and riders were really critical. A, lot, a big pile of, of uh, boulders and logs and good piles of soil. Um, Jeremy, I was wondering if you could talk a little about uh, how you approached this design build and what your vision was for the, the trail and the skills areas. Um, yeah, absolutely. This was, this was a really interesting project. It actually was very difficult. Um, because uh, we had very little uh, elevation to work with. So we're uh, designing skills for everyone um, was our intention. Um, and bi-directionally of this track is basically a loop 
um, part of it being that spine and then the main part of it being um, the gravel loop that you pointed out. And um, <laughs> our <laughs> our design and our ideas were far different than what was um, anticipated originally. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it, it, it took a lot more time and a lot more materials and rocks. <laughs> I told you I love rocks. I want more. I, we didn't have enough rocks. And in this photo, I'm, I'm choosing the rocks I want. And I said, I want all of them. That's why my arm is like this, <laughs> all the rocks. Um, yeah, so it was a really interesting project. Um, and so we're to come up with um, um, six adaptive challenges along this loop. And um, right here, you're looking at two of them. The one on the upper right that Chris Orr and I are test riding is a nice rock garden with uh, different levels of drops as you go along it. Um, right there, right in the middle of it. And then in the bottom left is a feature, ah, I forgot what we called it, um, but it's basically, you know, just kind of a technical section with some rocks and some roots and some logs so that adaptive riders can, and, and able-bodied riders alike, um, can test, test the waters with um, riding, you know, a trail with texture. And so, and then a couple other of the features are um, more of a berm features where you can kind of like test the, yeah, so there in the upper, I'm kind of going off the bigger part of the rock drop. It's about, it's close to about two feet. So it's, it's definitely substantial. And then um, that's the same rock guard in the bottom left. And then we're going uphill on a, one of the berms there in the bottom right. Um, and I like turns like this um, for progression sake, because you can test the waters with going higher and higher and higher up the wall and play with speed and things like that. It's really good for progression for all riders, adaptive um, and non-adaptive alike. Jeremy, what were some of the specific design considerations that you were taking into account here for um, adaptive riders specifically? Um, really just to build features that um, can accommodate, you know, a three-wheeled bike really, um, and are not gonna, you know, throw it off kilter, um, you know, in, in an extreme way. Um, and that, adaptive riders can ride with confidence without like pushing the envelope too much. That's basically the kind of design that we were features that we're trying to put in. Yeah, one thing that's really nice about this is because it's right next to the ADA trail, you can look at things and like see everything before you try it. You know, Jeremy had talked about that, that, you know, don't go riding something uh, alone for the first time. And here everything is is open and obvious. Um, and you can see everything um, before you kind of dip your attire uh, uh, into it. Um, you could ride one wheel on it and one wheel or two wheels on the path at the same time. So there's a lot of places for like flexibility and kind of um, uh, dipping your toe into it. Um, yep. And uh, that's one thing that I really like about this facility. That, and that's exactly right, Jill. And that was that was the intention um, was to make it so something you can just you know test the waters a little bit. You can dabble one wheel in, or just and look at it because that's a problem with a lot of trails. You can't look at it ahead of time. You just have to kind of throw caution to win and, and jump in. Um, and this you, with this area, you don't have to do that. You can totally examine everything. You can scope it, lap it own it is what we say you can that that scope part of it you can do that very easily and thoroughly and safely i see Ge georgina has a question about if it's a one directional bike trail and actually this is one of the only trails um, on the site uh, that is not one direction uh, it's a two directional trail um, but you can see like as jeremy said there's actually not a lot of there's very little it's pretty flat um, and they're very good sight lines um, so you can see other riders um, are coming um, uh, and, and I'll accommodate other other users, other riders who are there. Um, but it's a very and good question. Most of the trails on the site are uh, one way. And it's also uh, labeled uh, bi-directionally as well. So uh, one feature might be one rating in one direction and then a different rating in another direction. For example, like that big rock garden in the middle, 
going down it is going to be an A MTV two, but going up it is going to be a different rating uh, based on your equipment type. It's a, it's a really good point. Um, I noticed when Jeremy was test writing this, he was using both the uh, in no power mode, no assistant, uh, just with the hand cycle, as well as using the e-assist to try them both directions and in different types of of rider assistants um, to really get a good feel for the um, the facilities. Um, so um, I wanted to ask. Um, uh, JJ and Jerry, what do you think of the finished product? What do you think, uh, does this, what does this provide for the adaptive community? I think you I should wanna, probably- You wanna take that JJ? Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think I need to explain some things too. So, you know, this was the cherry on top. This was not a part of the original design. Um, as I became more involved, uh, Ross Swanson and I, the, the project manager for this started talking about the possibility of including an adaptive trail and, um, you know, uh, so part of it was um, finding a space that we could, uh, that, that was big enough so that we could build a loop. And then part of it was that, um, you know, because that location uh, does have uh, as many varying grades, it was, it was, it was challenging to find a spot where you could, you could actually build stuff in. And so it ended up being, I think, on the south side of the, or pardon me, on the north end of the park itself, so closer to Maywood Park. And it is it is pretty flat up there, um, just generally. And so um, for me in my wheelchair, it's, it's actually easier to, to park at Maywood Park and push down that bike path, that 205 bike path, and then access the park uh, just because it's more level in general. Um, and so it, it became a challenge though uh, for the designers as to what sort of features they would be able to put in there um, that are, you know, again, th that are going to um, uh, 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 keep people coming back uh, because they are challenging. And then just like out of the gate, not so challenging that people, that beginners are gonna be blown away. And so it's, it's, it's kind of a, a balance. You know, one of the big visions that, that, uh, that we had was like having uh, demo days. And so these adaptive uh, bikes, uh, hand cycles are quite expensive. And by quite expensive, I mean like 10,000 to 22, $23,000. Um, and so the thought of having a fleet of these is, is, um, is a great thought, but in all likelihood is not going to happen. So like getting these manufacturers to be able to come and demo these products and showing uh, uh, you know a couple of different models to like a group of twenty people was was also a big driving force in where we placed this location. If we had placed it somewhere where there was too much elevation gain, like a group of people couldn't kind of sit around and and talk and or look at things. And so, you know, with all of those factors, I I feel like this turned out fantastic. The other thing is that I, you know I did not really. Um, I did not have a lot of input as to what sort of features that, that were going to be installed. I just knew that they that they were going to put things in that that made it um, challenging and uh, and rewarding for um, uh, for us as as adaptive cyclists. Um, and so, you know, from from an ADA standpoint, it it turned out really well. It it is super accessible um, from a, an adaptive mountain bike standpoint you know, this particular track really is for beginners, but as your skill set progresses, you can move on to other features throughout the park. And um, Jeremy McGee can tell you that he actually has ridden, I think, almost all of the features throughout the entire park um, with his um, uh, adaptive bike. And um, that, that that's what you end up having to do as your skills get better. Um, so I, you know, for, uh, going into this with really um, just trying to make the space accessible um, to coming out of it with a really cool ex uh, adaptive mountain bike track. Yeah, uh, this has been a, a huge success for, for me and for those folks that are in this community, I think. So it was really cool to watch. Great. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that. Um, I guess that's a good segue. I wanted to make sure we have some a few minutes to talk about um, uh, what would you recommend to an agency or land manager wanting to create uh, trails or to provide um, uh, 
more information or access um, for adaptive mountain bicyclists? Would they go about rating their existing trails? What do you think would be the first step? Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> the answer to your question, yes, all the above. Um, and then, you know, every project is, is different, whether there's existing trails or they're cutting new trail. Um, you know, th this is a hot topic right now in the adaptive world. Um, I think I get at least one, if not 10 emails a day asking for, um, trail standards and, uh, trail standards are good. Um, when you're looking for one type of trail. Um, but the, the process is so organic that, um, trail standards, in my opinion, get in the way and cause problems down the road. Um, and really the only way honestly is to have a professional consultant out there for your project. That's the best way. Um, if the budget allows it, um, that's just, that it's just, there's so much involved with the gamut of riders with all the different levels of trails. Um, uh, the number one best way is to have a professional come out. Um, and that professional hopefully, you know, can assess the situation based on, um, the land management's, uh, desires and needs. Uh, for example, um, maybe, you know, a, maybe there's a trail of, you know, a black trail, for, let's say, um, that not all adaptive riders are going to be able to ride, but a lot, you know, some, you know, far right spectrum riders will be able to with a couple of, of issue updates um, on that trail. So, uh, you know, hopefully that professional will assess the, the, the current, the current trails and say, you know, okay, if you want to get to this level, here's the changes, this level, here's the changes, this level, here's the changes for that and provide a layered report um, in that way. And when it comes to creating new trails, that's the fun part. That's you know, where um, maybe you build something and then have an adaptive rider come out and ride it and, and tell what you think, tell, tell you what they think. That's pretty, I mean, that's pretty much the process. And then the design process, like what we do with Gateway Green, we, we walked the terrain and visualized and talked about the different features that we wanted to build and, then we jumped in the machines and built them. It was super fun. Um, I, I have a, a question. Um, what is the, what do you think is the most common problem you encounter in with riding or in assessing trails? And this could be actually be for both of you. Uh, uh, well, the number Jeremy, one Jeremy, always Jeremy. is, is the misconception that there's one type of adaptive trail and uh, the misconception or the desire to have an adaptive segregated trail, which is, totally not the way to go. JJ, what's your, um, what's the most problem problem you encounter when you're riding or checking out trails? I, I think, you know, uh, I had mentioned uh, uh, power assist and I think that, you know, for a lot of riders, like trying to figure out if they can use a power assist on a trail um, and, you know, if the, if the bike that they have um, constitutes as a mobility device, so there's some different rules for those. Um, and then, you know, the, the reality is there are many, many, many more trails that are out there. Um, and so it, it would make sense to have a rating system for existing spots, um, more so than trying to figure out how to retrofit um, to make it so that it's somewhat more accessible. Um, you know, I think uh, the other thing is uh, we had talked about like Powell Butte, which is another location in, in, um, uh, in Portland that uh, has a lot of mountain bike trails um, and just having uh, someone go in there and assess, you know, at, at what level those trails are to be ridden using, you know, Jeremy scale or um, something like that, I think is, is really key. And once the word gets out, um, you know, people are going to come depending on on what their um, what their level of comfort is, and if they need to bring someone with them, they, they'll do that. Um, so, yeah, the the challenges going forward, I think, are are again having um, you know spaces that uh, I mean, I unfortunately I can't just like get out of my car and hop on my hand bike. I have to do a bunch of other stuff, 
And so having uh, facilities where I can go to the bathroom, having a spot where, you know, I could um, uh, have some shade, those sort of things are, are also kind of issues. Um, and so, uh, you know, going forward, I, I think that um, uh, Portland is just starting to catch the bug for off-road adaptive cycling. Um, places like Bend, Oregon, it's, it, it's a much more vibrant scene. Um, and so looking at what they're doing that, that's right and uh, seeing if that's going to work for us and then uh, continuing to have these sort of conversations, um, I think, is, is really the key. And, um, you know, it's going to – this is just the beginning. There's going to be a ton more of these as time goes on. And so um, if we could figure out a way to, uh, to get it and make it kind of um, easy for everybody, that's, that's going to be the key. Great. I appreciate you mentioning uh, facilities outside of the trail itself. There's a good question in the chat. So it looks like it's for you, Jeremy. Do you yeah, I see it. Uh, great question, Simon. <laughs> to answer your question, um, I'm actually the U.S. dealer for Sport On, and uh, the answer is no. I can't show you, <laughs> um, <laughs> but just know that it's coming. Um, you can see the the bowhead bike. Um, that bike angulates in the front, um, and uh, you know the you know the good thing is that bike is deemed mobility equipment, like JJ said. Um, but regulations are coming down the pipe and bikes that are throttle only are going to be put into a different, the e-adventure category um, where there's no, there's no ability to pedal it manually at all. But yes, um, um, almost all bikes in, in the near future will be angulating and a lot narrower. Um, and I wish I could give you a sneak peek. I actually do have um, some 3d drawings, but I can, I'm, I can't show you. Um, but it's coming and all the work we're doing now is going to be obsolete because <laughs> the equipment is going to be so much more capable. It's going to, it's really cool. And it's really exciting. That's great. Um, reducing barriers. Um, thank you all um, so much. I think we're just about out of time. So I just wanted to give one more thank you to everyone for your questions and for attending and also to um, Jeremy and Jeremy, um, for their um, excellent um, input into this whole process, these trails and their advocacy that they do full time. Um, there's their contact information and mine. Um, I don't know if you have any parting thoughts. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs> oh, do, do Jeremy and I have parting yeah, thoughts? Yeah, same thing. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, um, thank you all very much um, for your time um, and for this uh, discussion about uh, Gateway Green. And hope you all could go check out the, the park too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Did you need right. us to hang on, Jill? No, I think that's it. And actually, I think there's another session that's starting soon, but we should have a follow up. Um, all right. We'll Thanks so much. That was great. I really appreciate it. Thank both you, of you all so much. So much. Appreciate you guys. For, for, Not doing um, a whole lot, but <laughs> have a good one. Yeah. Thanks. Adios.